Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. This channel is dedicated to finding out whether I really do know it all or not. Make sure you like and subscribe, and definitely make sure you ask questions in the comments or at my email address. Uh, so today I wanted to talk about something. I was talking with a friend and I thought, like, oh, this is an interesting topic and I should probably bring it up in this channel. And that is <laughs> Starship Booms. <laughs> like, ah. <laughs> so the question is, why is SpaceX failing so often building their starships? Um, under the circumstances, I want to be quite clear. We are talking about their experimental starship, this thing that I'm showing a picture of right now, not their Falcon 9, which has been flying for a long time, super, super safe, you know, Bob and Doug. <laughs> they haven't launched yet when I'm recording this, but I certainly am giving them, you know, all the best wishes and everything in this. But anyway, this is their experimental ship. That's their sort of next generation ship, right? So that's the, it's Spaceship 2.0 or something like that. Um, so why is it failing so often? There have been a bunch of Mark different spaceship, Mark something spaceships, and there have been four serial number spaceships that have been tested so far. So just to give a real quick timeline, there was like a Tank 2 that was uh, pressure tested to 8.5 bar and then exploded and, and intentionally, essentially. They kind of overpressured it to see how strong the tank was. And that was in January, January 28th, I believe, if I'm remembering correctly. Uh, then there was serial number one that had a rapidly unscheduled deconstruction, which is an RUD. Uh, just in case you uh, ever want to know, that's a, a term <laughs> that's being thrown around these days. Anyway, it had weld problems. And on February 28th, it went, it kaboomed. Um, <clears throat> then on April 2nd, yes, serial number three failed due to a, um, uh, a, a test configuration issue, which was that they pressured, they filled the top section, but they forgot to pressurize the bottom section. So if you think of something like an empty Coke can, right, if you step on that empty Coke can, it's going to go crunch and it'll, it's not that strong. If it's got pressure in it from the liquid and the carbon dioxide, it will stay nice and strong and you can step on it and nothing's going to happen to it. Uh, so anyway, that happened on April 2nd, and that took out serial number three. Serial number four, just yesterday, so as I'm recording this, that'd be May 29th, had uh, an issue, and it had several static fires with different Raptor engines, um, and uh, it appears that what happened was that there was a feed drain line from the methane farm that actually puts the methane into the rocket ship, and the transfer thing it looks like some sort of valve or something broke or somebody turned it on or something stupid happened and it went psh. so the footage I'm going to show you is from Everyday Astronaut and if you're not subscribed to him good god <laughs> make sure you go check him out I'm putting a link to his channel in the description he's an amazing guy he uh, has he does these wonderful deep dives into all sorts of cool topics on space so if you're at all interested in space he also has a live stream camera obviously pointed at the, the starships right now in Boca Chica, Texas. So anyway, definitely go check him out. But anyway, as you can see from the pictures, essentially what happened was it uh, it started venting after the static fire. It started venting methane out the bottom very violently. And then at some point, some spark happened somewhere underneath the ship and it just, the whole thing went kaboom. Um, there's a at the top, there is this really, really heavy mass simulator, which is two giant rolls of stainless steel and a block, and it, who knows how many tons it weighed, but it weighed a lot, and it just went straight up in the air and came straight back down again. So it was a very violent explosion. Uh, so, yeah, I... <laughs> It, it is what it is. Okay, so that's sort of the quick history of how these things happened. Um, why is it happening? That's the question. So SpaceX's sort of philosophy is build fast, fail fast, iterate fast, do new things, right? So if you think about it from a business model, that's kind of a lighter, more agile business model than a very, very s slow, careful um, iteration of every single part, making sure everything's fine, making sure nothing's the matter, right? All of that kind of stuff. This is a whole different idea. This would be the difference between, uh, you know, an old, like, 
AT&T or something, I guess prior to the cell phone world, because that changed everything. But, you know, Ma Bell, back in the day, back before they were broken up in the 1980s, they were an incredibly stodgy, slowly developing company that made things really, really slowly. As opposed to a company that's much more agile and changing all the time, something like Amazon that, you know, is just rapidly iterating on, on things that are happening. So, so anyway, that's the kind of ant- antithesis between the two modus operandi, uh, the MOs of the way that these companies operate. So anyway, that's definitely their MO. SpaceX's MO is build fast, fail fast, figure it out, go on. Um, Okay, so if you think about this, this is very much more like building rockets in the 1950s than it is like building rockets in, say, the 1960s. So everybody thinks back to the Gemini and Apollo eras when things were... Okay, it was still super, super risky, and they were doing stuff way at the cutting edge, but they were very, very slow and careful about how they did things. In the 1950s, both the Soviet Union and, by, by the way, in the 60s, I'm talking about NASA, because in the 1960s, the Soviet Union, they did this all behind closed doors so that they wouldn't have to face public shaming if it didn't work. But they had the same build fast, iterate fast, blow things up and see what happens uh, mentality. And, and it was very, very effective. It worked really well. But anyway, in the 1950s, nobody knew what the heck they were doing, right? The rocket, the V2 rocket was only created in the 1940s. So the it was the infancy of rocketry and trying to put something in orbit, or at least very, very high in the air above the atmosphere, uh, was an immense challenge. There were so many different things that they didn't know. So effectively, NASA and uh, the Soviet counterpart, they were just building stuff they were lighting it up and it would explode or else it'd get up in the air and explode or else it would go crazy. So that's, you know, most of the rocketry explosions that you see, like when they have compilations of that are from that time period because they were just building stuff and they were trying it out and seeing what would happen. Uh, oftentimes it didn't work, but you get a huge, huge, huge amount of data. There's only so much stuff that you can get from simulations. Even nowadays when we have supercomputers that are immensely powerful and can do fluid dynamic simulations and so forth. They can give you all kinds of really good and useful information, but there ain't nothing like going out and trying it for real. So right when you light that candle, you find out whether it works or not. And if it doesn't work, if you have good telemetry, which means that it's sending lots of data from the ship down to a ground recording station, you can then go pick that apart after the failure happens. Um, <clears throat> and that's sort of what's going on here, right? They're, they're taking a very different tack. In the 1960s and certainly into the 1970s and 80s, uh, NASA became very stodgy. They were just build a piece, test the piece, make sure it's all working properly. Build the next piece, test the next piece, and make sure it's all working properly. You can look at the, uh, the, the Space Launch System, the SLS, as an example of this incredibly slow development, right? This is essentially just a rebuilt, repurposed um, space shuttle, uh, booster rockets, the solid rocket boosters, the fuel tank. It's got the same engines as the space shuttle. This thing should have been built like that, you know, in no time at all. But everything's being tested incredibly carefully, incredibly slowly. It's, It's a safe way to go, but it's also a very stodgy way to go. It's going to take a long time and it's going to be expensive. Blue Origin is another example. Um, oh gosh, it's in Latin, but it's uh, it's something like tread fierceful, fear, fiercely slowly or something like that. I'll put the Latin underneath it. Uh, but anyway, it's it's essentially they're just saying like go step by step fiercely. I think that's what it translates to. But anyway, it's like go slowly. <laughs> so Blue Origin is a very, very different philosophy from SpaceX. It's everything is slow. Everything's contained. You know what you're doing. You know what you're going to get before you get there as much as humanly possible. Uh, SpaceX, again, light, agile, move it, see what happens. You know, <laughs> whatever happens, happens, and we'll figure it out from there. Uh, okay, so anyway, so the two have their values, right? It's it's kind of embarrassing, I'm sure, to SpaceX and expensive to have these things fail over and over again. But it's probably less expensive, for sure it's less expensive to have these things fail than it is to uh, spend so many years just building a single part or something and then let the entire system wait for that part to get done before you build the next part. Uh, I think one other thing you can witness with SpaceX's design is like they were originally going to build the Starship out of carbon fiber 
and well, not originally, but the last iteration of it was going to be to build it out of carbon fiber. And they actually got to the point where they built this gigantic last and they had this huge thing that they were building. And then Elon Musk and the engineers were like, damn, this is going to take forever to build this thing this way. Right. And it's going to be super expensive. So chuck that out. Let's try some stainless steel. <laughs> so, you know, now it looks like a like a V2 rocket, essentially, you know, it just looked like a, an old school, like 1010 kind of rocket or something rather than the modern things. So very cool, very interesting. Um, I think one other thing to point out about this, though, is that if you look at the dates, serial number one failed on February 28th. Just over a month later, on uh, April 2nd, there was the failure of serial number three, and then the last one ha failed on the 29th of May. So that's getting close to two months. So there's a kind of a stretching out, and the last two failures were not failures of the ship. They were failures of protocol, or potentially in this last one, it could have been a valve or something that got stuck, not on the rocket ship, but near the rocket ship. So these are all really important things to think about, because... In a way, there were a couple of tank failures that happened, and then there was a serial number two, um, ser excuse me, serial number one failure on 228. But aside from that, they have really actually worked pretty well. So we'll see what happens when they actually start doing their 150 meter hops, which hopefully will be soon. <laughs> I know everyone's like, next week, next week, next week. I think because they just blew up serial number four. and they have to put serial number five uh, on the stand and do the whole thing over again, it will probably, I would guess, maybe, let's say the third week of June, maybe. If things go well, of course. If another, if there's another rapidly unscheduled deconstruction, then probably it will be much later. But anyway, so, um, so anyway, I hope that helps to explain a little bit of why Starship is failing so spectacularly over and over again. It is a design philosophy, and there is a benefit to this. There's a lot of data to be collected from failure. Um, one thing that I think, personally, is that you learn much, much more from failure than you do from success. Success can only reinforce something that you already know. Failure will teach you something new. Um, I try to impart that to my students as I teach them. It is a very scary concept that... It's more important to fail than it is to succeed in a way. I mean, eventually it's important to succeed. But along the way, if you fail, you figure things out because that makes you question your sense of reality and what's going on. Everything from real small stuff to, you know, astronomical things or the end of the 19th century physicists were like, yeah, we got everything figured out. Nothing's wrong and nothing's nothing's a problem anymore. And then along came the black body experiment and along came the Michelson Morley speed of light experiment. And they were like, uh Oh, so, so failed experiments were actually opened up the world to general relativity and to quantum mechanics and so forth and led to the computer revolution, right? So these are failures. Failures are super important for people to learn from. So, you know, in a way, obviously SpaceX wasn't, doesn't want to do this forever because it's going to run them out of money if they keep spending money <laughs> building these things and failing. But the, the failures are super important. It teaches them things and they learn stuff from it. So... Anyway, I guess go SpaceX. <laughs> way, to, way to fail forward. How's that? Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, definitely make sure you hit the thumbs up and subscribe. It helps other people to find this channel, which is awesome. And above all, make sure you ask questions to me in the comments or at my email address, which is drknowitallknows at gmail.com. Till next time, bye-bye.